Okay, well, the first, the first thing I want to say is that uh, between Joe and I, we have enough material here for about seven or eight days, and we don't think we're going to get through it all. So I believe that my slides, at least, will be available on some time. So I'm going to skip through some of what I've, I've, I've prepared very quickly. So it's going to go by real fast. I don't expect you to actually get it, but maybe I can make some sort of highlight points. So be warned that this is going to be kind of like a movie rather than a slide presentation. So the first thing is that um, when you look, so Joe's made a pretty convincing case that at least humans do control the effective impedance of limbs under some circumstances. The obvious way to think about that is to say, well, you've got these muscles, and the muscles have this property that the stiffness goes up when they generate tension. You have two of them, uh, two opposing actuators operating about a joint, and that's how you get control of stiffness. So putting aside, this is just, if you, if you make the assumption of constant moment arms, assume that you have a linear force length relationship. This is grossly simplified. What I wind up with is that the effective behavior is because of the fact that Opposing torques always subtract when you have the muscles on the opposite sides of a joint. This is obvious, but the impedance terms always add, right? And that's true independent of, of, of the kinematics. It's because of the fact that impedances are bilateral effects and the forces and torques are unilateral. So you always get this. The joint stiffnesses, the opposing impedances add, the joint stiffness is positive if the actuator's stiffness is positive, and that looks good, and you can co-contract muscles and your arm gets stiffer. So it looks interesting, and you know, this is, ignore this for the present. But the problem is that uh, that previous statement is only true if you have constant moment arms. But it's a characteristic of the kinds of me mechanisms that we have. We are endoskeletons. We have the bones on the inside and the muscles on the outside. Right? Because of that, that means that, in general, the moment arm that the muscle makes about the joint depends upon configuration. If you have a variable configuration, then it will contribute a term to the effect of stiffness, and that effect of stiffness can, can be, be negative. So, again, ignore these things if you're not familiar with them, but this is, imagine the antagonist length is a function of the joint angle, but I'm going to make an assumption that its derivative is, is uh, such that it's what I would expect if the, an, if the agonist gets short as the joint rotates. I assume a linear force displacement relationship. Take the antagonist and I do everything similar except now I have a different sign because the agonist is, is getting long as the, as the joint rotates. I, can, I take a look at them both and what I wind up with is that the effect of stiffness depends both on the stiffness of each of the muscles multiplied by the square of the moment arm but it also depends upon the fact that the moment arm changes as a function of the, of the configuration. So the, very, the variation of the moment arm with respect to the uh, configuration contributes a term that looks like stiffness. And not only that, but that term can, in some cases, be negative. And if the math doesn't make sense, do you consider this, which is I, the way I like to present it to my students. This is what I call the tent pole effect. So imagine you have a pole that's uh, constrained to rotate about this pivot point, but otherwise it's free to move in a plane. This is the configuration variable for that system. I imagine I have two tension actuators, one called agonist, one called antagonist. They connect to a base at equal distances from the pivot point. But now what you can see is that as I increase that angle, this moment arm here gets bigger and this one gets smaller. Is that, is that obvious from, from the diagram? If not, stop me because this is critical. Well, what that means is that now suppose I make these uh, linear, these things here into pure tension actuators. They generate tension only independent of length. Well, if I take a pure tension actuator with something with zero impedance, that's always unstable for any non-zero tension. You tighten up those cables, the thing falls over. It can't be stable statically. On the other hand, if I said, well, I have actuators which have a constant stiffness, that is that the tension generated by the actuator changes as a function of its length. The actuator is a little bit shorter, the tension goes down, the actuator gets a bit longer, the tension goes up. Okay, that'll give me a system that can be stable, but only for a limited range of tensions. If, on the other hand, I have something like mammalian muscle, which has this property that stiffness is proportional to tension, 
then provided I get the proportionality constant right, I can um, make this system such that it will be stable for all values of tension. The bottom line here is that uh, what I have is that if, if I take a look at this, the kinematics matters. Kinematics, this is the reason why I think that when you're talking about impedances, you have to include the configuration because that's what makes mechanical stuff hard. It's the, it's the geometry makes it hard. The dynamics is easy. It's just F equals MA. But the dynamics with this nasty geometry. Kinematics matters. And this kinematic stiffness term can dominate. And in addition, the impedance matters. So if you tried to make a, a system with tension actuators with zero, with zero output impedance, it's going to have a hard time working. So intrinsically variable impedance actually is highly desirable. But this sort of raises the specter of another problem that has uh, plagued attempts to do control of contact, which is the general problem of stability. So here I'm talking about static stability, but stability can be a dynamics problem. And it's a general problem. It's not just a problem of trying to control the force exerted on a stiff surface. Anytime I have an object coupled to a control system, the contact and interaction couples the dynamics, and this can cause instability. And I'm going to show you that by looking at a very simplified example, which I hope will work. So suppose I imagine this is idealized linear uh, control system, kind of stuff that we do in our undergraduate uh, classes on control. So I imagine I've got a, a mass restrained by a linear spring and damper driven by a control actuator and some external force. So this is mass times acceleration. This is in the little plus domain. Damping, stiffness times, times a displacement variable. This is external force. This is my uh, control actuator. Express that as, a, that as a transfer function, standard second order form. Now I assume a very simple controller. I take the integral of some tra trajectory error. So I assume I have a desired place I want to be, which is R. Compute the error, multiply by a gain, and integrate. Standard in integral action controller, couple those two together, and I wind up with this description here, which is output position, input reference, and I have this expression here. I know how to make the system so that it's stable. It's trivial to show that the uh, stability will require an upper bound on the controller gain. I, I, I can use high gain, but it can't be infinite. And all I have to do is make the gain stro smaller than that parameter there, right? Standard sort of thing that you'll run, to, run into in design of linear control systems. What happens, however, is if you take that system previously, and remember, I also can have it interact with something externally. Well, if I do that, if the external object is a mass, so I now have the mass, which gives me force related to acceleration, which is the Laplace variable squared times displacement, I couple that in. The mass coupled, the object mass now shows up in this position. It shows up here in the transfer function relating position to the reference. And now, coupled stability will require this condition. However, what that means is that if I was to choose any positive controller gain whatsoever that satisfies the system being stable in isolation with no mass attached to it, you pick that and then leave it fixed, I'll always be able to find a mass that will destabilize that system. All I have to do is pick a mass that's bigger than this number here, and I'm guaranteed that the coupled system is unstable when the isolated system is stable. This is no mention of forces. This is just plain old PID control, the sort of thing that you'll do as, an, as in an undergraduate controls class. So coupling is a, a real problem. OK, so how do we deal with this? Well, the approach that I'm advocating is that what we do is we want to try to find conditions to avoid instability due to contact and interaction. The basic approach that I'm advocating is first try to describe the manipulator and the controller as though it was all physical stuff, an equivalent physical system. Then see if you can find an equivalent physical behavior that will avoid the problem. That is, we use what we know about physical systems to figure out a physical system that would behave well. And then try to design a controller to impose that interaction port behavior. So let me, get, let me show you what I'm going I'm to try and do. And we're under time pressure, so this is the bit that's going to go by fairly fast. So the, the first part is I'm going to take a general object. And as you'll see in, I, in uh, tomorrow's lab, I believe, you can describe that using the, the Lagrangian formulation. This is standard material that most of you will have had. Anybody not know what the word Lagrange means? Whew, good. 
Okay, so this is the standard Lagrangian. I can make, for example, assume that I have a system that's passive and neutrally stable in isolation, write it in this form. This would be the Lagrangian, which is the sum of the kinetic co-energy minus the potential energy. This is an external force. These are frictional terms. But what I'm going to do to make my life easy is I'm going to do a Legendre transform, which is defined here. And passing over the math very quickly, that lets me convert the Lagrangian form to a Hamiltonian form. And the big plus of the Hamiltonian form, it's the same math, just recast. The Hamiltonian form is such that the Hamiltonian, this H sub E, is the sum of the kinetic energy and the potential energy. So it's the total system energy, and that's going to make the stability analysis easy. As I said, I'm going to pass over this very quickly. The key, by the way, of the Hamiltonian form is that these, this, is uh, this is displacement, this is momentum. The time derivatives are related to partials of the total system energy, but with opposite signs. And that opposite sign is what makes the analysis get easy. I, I, I'm a great fan of uh, William Rowan Hamilton. If you don't know about him, you should go read about him. He did all this really cool stuff way, way back. Back in the early Victorian era, he invented stuff that we only started using 10, 20 years ago. For example, quaternions were, his, were one of his, his major contributions. It's only when we got to video games that quaternions became computationally important. Anyway, and I like to, to make the point that Hamilton is one of a long line of illustrious Dublin men. Berkeley, Boyle, Dunlop, Fitzgerald, Hamilton, Kelvin, Larmer, Parsons, Stokes. This is the Stokes, this is the Stokes from the Navier-Stokes equation. All these bright Irish guys. Anyway, moving on. So the question is, uh, how do we go about describing the behavior that, if we could get it, would be, well, would, would, would be good to have? And here the idea is we're going to take advantage of passivity. And the basic idea is that I have a system that cannot indefinitely supply power. And to give you a look ahead, the thinking is, look, if I have this system and it's able to go unstable, going unstable for a mechanical system means somehow I'm getting energy into it. So if I could design a behavior that couldn't do that, then I've got a system that can't go unstable. Now, it turns out when you get into the math details, what I mean by passive, there are lots of definitions. I recommend John Wyatt's paper. But the basic idea is that the total system energy has a lower bound, right? What I can do is I can have power flow be positive or negative. That is, I can take a system, I can dump power into it, and I can get power out of it, but I can't do that indefinitely. So I can take, imagine a spring. I can do work on the spring, and the spring can then, then do work back on me, but I can't pump it and get power out of it indefinitely. Does that make sense? So power in is positive, no limit. Power out is negative. I can only get power out until I exhaust the st stored energy. A subtlety is passivity doesn't mean stability. Passivity just means that I, c I can't have, use this thing as a continuous power source and there are numerous examples of systems that are passive but not stable. My favorite one is, imagine a wire, two beads on it, frictionless wire, and I give the two beads a uh, similar charge. I bring them from infinity out to the center and I store a finite amount of energy in there and I can only get that finite amount out, but that system is guaranteed unstable. If you leave it go, the beads will head off to infinity. So passive is not the same as stable. However, what I'm going to do for this case is I'm going to consider stability in the sense of convergence to some equilibrium point. I'm going to use Lyapunov's second method, which is basically a generalization of thinking about energy. And it's like if I can define a system where the energy tells me what I want and I can make sure that the total energy in the system always goes down, then I'm going to converge to equilibrium provided I set it up correctly. And you can't always get away with using energy as a Lyapunov function, but I'm going to set it up so that I can. So essentially, the equilibria are at energy minima. Dissipation says that I reduce energy, therefore I converge to e equilibrium. Now I'm going to rush past what, what follows very quickly, because I don't have time for it. But I'm going to define steady state by putting constraints on the uh, Hamiltonian representation. Note that I'm, to do this, I'm going to have to not have static friction. I'm going to go to a slightly compressed notation because it gets too uh, messy to have all those partials in there. I'm going to define isolated stability and basically what happens is that my isolated Hamiltonian system will be stable provided I have non-zero dissipation forces. You have friction, the energy goes away, that's it. 
as I said, this is going to go fast. However, now I've got to think about physical interaction. And this is an important point, so I'm going to take a little bit of time on it here. If I think about the interaction of general dynamic systems, there's lots of ways I could do that. I could, for example, have cascade, parallel, or feedback interconnections, and maybe even others. If I take, imagine I take two linear systems. The first one gives me an input, an operator, and an output. The second one gives me input, operator, output. Cascade coupling says I take the output of the uh, the uh, the output of the the the, f the first system y1 becomes the input to the second system, right? And I now take the complete system, and I give it its input u3 becomes u1. So the coupled system input goes here into u1, generates output y1, y1 becomes input to system two, and the output of system two is the output of the coupled system. Straightforward cascade coupling. Combination looks like this, but this is a, co a, a connection that cannot power continuous because I have no guarantee that the product of Y3 and U3 is the sum of the products of Y2, U2, and Y1, U1. But that's a constraint. If I'm interacting physical systems, the interaction can't generate power. It has to be power continuous. In other words, I can't get power just out of connecting two pieces. So if these two, U and Y, are power conjugates, then the Gs are either impedances or admittances. You choose. My, con my connection must be power continuous, so I have to have this relationship, and I don't get it for the cascade connection. So I can't do cascade connection to physical systems. So I have to be careful when I talk about the connection. Turns out that I can do parallel and feedback connection of linear systems. Power continuity says that if I look at the parallel connection equations, they satisfy the power continuity. Feedback connection satisfy the power continuity. So if you're used to thinking of control systems in terms of operations on blocks, and you try to apply that to the interaction between physical systems, not all the operations that you can do with your block diagram represent what you can do with the physical system. So you've got to be careful. In practice, it's very easy to apply this. All you do is you say, look, I define some interaction port. This is some set of points where the objects interact. Get the equations relating those points to the generalized configuration variables, the generalized coordinates. Take the derivative. That's the Jacobian. Now all I have to do is apply this, and this actually is derived from the assumption of power continuity. So if you have these two relations, guarantees power continuity, you're done. Now I go plug that into the math. Take my simple impedance go through all of this behavior, but recast it into Hamiltonian form, find a constraint on damping. Now I'm going to make this go by real fast. Mass coupled to simple impedance. The damping is sufficient to give me uh, unconstrained stability. General object coupled to simple impedance. Again, what's happening is I've got general object defined by Hamiltonian with a total energy. My impedance control manipulator is defined by Hamiltonian, which has something that looks like total energy. I stick them together. The total energy of the combined system is the sum of their energies. That's guaranteed because energy always has linearly. Go through the math, and I wind up now with a condition which says that a condition that's sufficient for stability of an object by itself or my simple impedance controller coupled to an arbitrarily small mass, if that's stable, stick them together, and that's sufficient to have the um, two st systems stay stable. So I then go look at the implementation of my simple impedance. We talked about this before. And I wind up with a system that, again, can be cast in Hamiltonian form. And if I go by this real fast, now because of an assumption that I'm going to make here, I wind up only with local asymptotic stability, but that's better than nothing. Look at the couple stability. And what I wind up again is that the conditions that I put on my controller to be stable without coupling are sufficient to ensure local asymptotic stability of the system when it's coupled. And as I said, I apologize, it's going fast and real fast. There's a nice feature to this that I think is often neglected. And that is, with the simple impedance controller, what I'm doing is I'm taking a desired behavior at some point and mapping it into a behavior in the configuration space. As a result of that, what happens if I get the kinematics wrong? What happens if I thought I was contacting here, but in fact I was contacting someplace else? Well, now that means that the controller maps to this configuration point x tilde. And x tilde depends upon the 
um, configuration variables of the, of the manipulator, but it's not the same as the one that I thought I had. Ordinarily, that would be a problem, right? However, I still have a positive definite non-decreasing function in some region about where that thing thinks it is. I can still define a Hamiltonian. If I assume that the kinematics are self-consistent, by that I mean that I've got a relationship between configuration variables in point on the, on, on the robot. It's not the one I thought I had, but it's consistent in the sense that the derivative is, is correct. That is that I want the erroneous Jacobian to be the correct derivative of the erroneous kinematics. That's what would happen if instead of touching the endpoint of the robot, I touched some other point. So now I'm touching here. Well, okay, the kinematics are wrong, but the Jacobian is correct. If I do that, I wind up with a set of conditions that again satisfy. I go through the analysis, figure out the Hamiltonian, get the, the state equations, rate of change in isolation. Same conditions for stability are still su sufficient. And what I wind up with is that the conditions that were sufficient to ensure local asymptotic coupled stability are still they will still guarantee local asymptotic coupled stability. Basically, I don't have to assume small kinematic errors, and the system is stable, at least based on this analysis, on, under these conditions. And if you think about how this is going on, it's what I've done is the equivalent of, I've attached, think of it as an elastic band, maybe with some damping, which I attach to the endpoint of the robot, and I attached it to some place where that's not fixed. Now I take that thing and I, I, I move it around. If I push on the end point, okay, it, sta it, it stably returns to, to whatever point the elastic band determined. Now I push the system somewhere else. Well, okay, I've, made it, I've, I've perturbed it, but as long as I have sufficient damping to get rid of the energy that I've added, the system is again stable, independent of where I push on, on, the, on the aroma. And that's what's, what the analysis says. Um, this is really the point where I think I should probably stop, but the, the, the main point here is that this kind of analysis allows me to, I can take these results and I can extend them not just to objects which I assumed were, uh, had a stable configuration, but I can send it to objects which are neutrally stable. It's typically what you have to deal with if you have a, a mass sitting on a surface, it doesn't care. It doesn't move indefinitely, but it doesn't care wh where you put it. I can apply it to sy systems with kinematic constraints, with no dynamics. Again, imagine I have set up an effective elastic behavior around the hand. If I have that interact with the kinematic constraint, no dynamics, but I still don't, I don't generate instability. In I can handle interface dynamics. Typically, my robot is not just a robot with, uh, with idealized kinematics. If I add in the dynamics of a sensor, Typical force sensor has elastic dynamics, for example. Well, those dynamics themselves don't add energy, so by this analysis, I can handle them. So essentially, this simple-minded impedance control, if you can get it, provides a very robust solution. Of course, it depends very heavily on this assumption. But the basic idea here is that even if it's hard to do, it's beneficial to impose a physical system structure. And that's really the idea behind impedance control. Take Take your control problem, make it look like finding an appropriate collection of springs and masses and dampers and other things like that, and then try to design a controller to implement that. And remember that the, what mounts, counts is the apparent behavior. It's the behavior that, it's what something feels like where you touch it. As I've said before, Mechanical physics imposes constraints that are beyond what you'll get from just looking at information. And the key one is this fact that the transformation of force-like variables, meaning force, momentum, force rate, transform uniquely in the opposite direction from the motion-like variables. And you can use that to set up controllers that don't care about things like redundancy. And I didn't go into the details of that, but I can provide you with a paper. So let's go back here and say, okay, remember my simple impedance controller? Now, it's not the best way to do things, and I'm, you're going to hear, I think, tomorrow from uh, <laughs> about more sophisticated impedance control. The gentleman who just walked in here. But the basic idea is I'm going to specify some nonlinear spring and damper behavior, transform it to actuator coordinates, assume that I've got very well designed actuators, and proceed. Now, it's a crude approach, it's, it's simple-minded impedance control, but it's very robust. 
I can operate as singularities. It's robust to contact in the wrong place. And for that, it's the basis of the approach that we've used. <laughs> Thanks for watching and stay with us. There's much more ahead on CNN, including today's edition of Pioneers. Take a look. MIT scientists Hermano Ego Krebs and Neville Hogan are using robots to help stroke victims with brain injuries regain movement. Their arm robots have already helped patients move shoulders and wrists, enabling them to do things they couldn't do for themselves, like shower or put on clothes. It isn't just a matter of moving. We are seeing something that looks like we're influencing a change in the brain. I think that's probably the most important thing we've seen so far. Now they're focusing on the lower extremities with ankle bots, which they hope will not only help patients walk again, but also help avoid dangerous falls after their strokes. The robots work by providing a video game on a screen, which prompts users to perform an exercise. If they don't make that movement within a certain period of time, then the robot will initiate it. If they do make a movement within that period of time, the robot goes along and helps them. So what we think is happening is that the visual display evokes the intent to move. A short time later, movement actually happens, and that sensory information comes back up to the brain. A future goal is to one day have an entire robotic gym for all parts of the body. I apologize for CNN's exuberance there, but anyway, the, the, this is an application that my colleagues and I have been uh, working on for quite some time. Uh, clinically, it works. It's not magic, but it works. But one of the key things is to make sure that this system can interact with a human that we know very little about. Not only do we, can we not model uh, unimpaired humans, but this is a, a, a human with, with a stroke. So the chances of coming up with, a, with an a priori model of their behavior, don't bother. And not only, by the way, not, not only can you not model the stroke patient's present dynamics, but with, with luck, that dynamics is changing as you're providing therapy. So model-based approaches, not very good. So basically what we've used here is we use this simple impedance control. We design robots that have very clean dynamics, very low friction, very high bandwidth current controlled actuators. We do this simple, quotes unquote, nonlinear impedance control, and it's worked so far. But having said that, we'd like to take this approach and apply it to cases where we're able to support up to the full body weight of a human. And this is where we need high force and low variable impedance. So I'd like to be able to pick up a human so generate forces on the order of 80 to 100 or maybe more kilos. Some of our stroke patients, by the way, are large humans. The reason they got the stroke is because they got a heart problem. The reason they got a heart problem is because they have a uh, dimension problem. <laughs> but anyway, why don't we want to generate big forces. Well, we've used electromechanical actuators. We want to get an electromechanical actuator that can generate forces around a kilo. You probably got, I mean, 80 to 100 kilos, you're probably going to have to add gears. Gears are bad news because I also want to get this feather light finger, you know, I want to be able to get a, an impedance as low as effectively the impedance I get with my fingers or hands. That's hard to do. We don't know any good technology that will do it. If you look at electromagnetic, you get very good uh, ability to render impedance, but you get an extremely high mass that, that comes with that. So an electromechanical actuator that could pick me up is huge, absolutely enormous. Okay, you can add gears, but the problem with, with adding gears is that, well, that improves your ability to generate force, but now you add in the friction from the gearing and all of the in, uh, parasitic dynamics in the motor, meaning it's effective viscosity, it's effective friction, it's effective inertia, get multiplied by the square of the gear ratio. So this gives you good force to mass ratio, but very poor ability to render impedance. Hydraulics are about the same. Hydraulics give you excellent force to mass ratio, but very, very high impedance actuators. Remote transmissions and pneumatics, so far, not very impressed. So, I think that's, I think it's muted there, so. Force feedback looks very, very appealing in this context, right, because Imagine this is a, m a model of, of my system. This is a mass driven by an actuator subject to external forces, but it's got some nonlinear friction term which may depend upon configuration or velocity. 
single uh, one degree of freedom example. I take this, imagine I've got a force feedback controller which essentially says use the actuator to power assist the external force. You measure the external force, feed it back, make the actuator force proportional to the external force. That's great, solve the equations, and now you wind up with this. If you could do it, it, you would scale down both the mass and the friction by one plus the force feedback gain. So that'd be great, right? Why not do that? And the problem is because you run into this problem of coupled instability, which I think I showed you here. So this is Steve Berger taking a screw a robot with a very low friction screwdriver, but it's, it's low friction but not zero friction. And he's... Uh, having it simply interact with a spring. And when you push on the spring, the system starts to oscillate and the oscillations grow without bound or until Steve stops it because he wants to graduate and doesn't want the hardware to break. And the problem gets worse the stiffer the spring gets. So here's a slightly stiffer spring. And now you see that the problem is more violent Oscillation. This is a problem that's been well known since the 70s, that if you try to do force feedback control, it's very difficult to stabilize. Okay, one of the ways to go about this is to try to impose passivity. So if, you're, if passivity doesn't make sense to you, here's, a, here's one of the ways to, to think about it. This is a feedback block diagram of the interaction between two things, that which, one of which is described as an impedance, the other of which is described as a, an admittance. And because of the fact that they are coupled at a common point, the velocities may be common, but therefore the forces have to change sign. In other words, the force on this one has to be the negative of the force on that one. That means that I get, in effect, a negative a unity gain, negative feedback loop coupling these two pieces. Well, with that, if I take a passive system, then the passive impedance is constrained so that the phase difference, or the, the phase relation between its input and output has to be con constrained to lie between plus and minus 90 degrees. Let me see if I can make that make sense. So I presume you guys are familiar with representing uh, dynamics in the complex plane. Yes, no, okay, good. And so you can represent a sinusoidally varying variable as a phasor, meaning a vector that rotates. Okay, so now you can represent an operator like Z as something that takes your input vector and rotates it some way, maybe changes its magnitude. To be passive, I have to make sure that the product of the force and the velocity is always sign definite, as in, for example, if I decide the power is positive in, the product of force and velocity has to always be positive, never negative. So that means that I have to make sure that, I never, that my operator never rotates the output force relative to the input velocity more than plus or minus 90, otherwise it's not passive. If it goes beyond 90, then I could, in theory, pump this system to get continuous power out of it. So passivity, in the linear case, is a constraint on phase. I basically can't pump the system. Okay, so the physical interaction resembles unity ne negative feedback, so if I was able to make my... I think this worked, right? For the time being. Um, so if I, if, I make my, if I make this system have this phase constraint, and let's say this is my controlled robot, and the object I'm interacting with already has that phase constraint because it is a passive object, then I couple these two systems together and the maximum phase change I can get is 180. of torture. So the bottom line here is that if I constrain this system to have phase between plus and minus 90, I have no way to go unstable. And notice that although I have constrained the phase, I've put no constraint on the, the magnitude. So in principle, passive systems can do quite a lot for you. So imposing passive robot impedance guarantees stability coupled to all passive objects, and they can be arbitrary co complicated and not stuck with just simple springs, masses, and dampers. It can be as many springs, and masses, and dampers as you want. But, as you might expect, there are problems. 
So it turns out that real passivity is hard to achieve, and the main reason it's hard to achieve is because if I've got a discrete time implementation, my discrete time implementation inevitably in induces a delay, and the delay means that at some frequency the phase gets bigger than 90, and I can't get around that. The other problem is that if I have high gain force feedback and I have any kind of resonant dynamics in the system, I will guarantee to violate passivity at some force feedback gain. And it turns out that if you look at force feedback, passivity is extremely conservative. And in fact, you can show that if you put any resonant dynamics between the sensor and the actuator, that is, you have a non-co-located system, then a force feedback reduction by more than 50% is non-passive. Basically, you have a severe limit on the force feedback loop gain. So you'd like to be able to do this, but if you, ex if you require passivity, it's too conservative with force feedback. By the way, it's not conservative if you limit yourself to motion feedback. More on that later. So what Steve Berger did, he's defined this thing called complementary stability, which is basically a way to say, look, we're not going to interact with all objects. We're only going to interact with a limited set of them. It's going to be our characterization of humans. We're not going to characterize humans in detail, but we're going to say they've got a maximum and minimum stiffness, maximum and minimum inertia, et cetera, et cetera, which we can do. He then takes this, represented the robot by impedance, defined a stability that will be robust to variations in the effective uh, admittance of the environment, in this case describing a human. Did controller design by a, basically a, a constrained search. Defined stability in terms of the small gain theorem. Here's an example. He imagines that he's got, this represents dynamics of force sensor. This is a dynamics of the robot, simplified as to have a system with a single resonant mode. Here's an idealized controller with a simple pole and zero. Here's an idealized representation of the human described as an admittance. You define stability by the structure singular value. I'm glossing over a lot here, but he picked the parameters of the, of the uh, lab robot module to describe this and parameters here based on what we knew about humans. Designed the controller and comes up with particular non-obvious results for the uh, choice of gain. It basically, we, the, the optimal came out to be a combination of a lead and a lag. And applied it to this system here, which is an early prototype of one of our robots. It's a screw-driven robot module. Reasonable force capacity, but because of the screw, you end up with a lot of Coulomb friction. Our modeling, by the way, was linear. The robot is significantly nonlinear. We tested to see how well it worked. And we basically tested by having the robot bump into objects and see when it was stable. That's what you saw in the previous videos. And here's what we got for performance. This is force versus displacement, or position. The red line is what we asked for. That's the ideal impedance that we'd like to have. The blue line is what we get if we just use position PD control, position and velocity control. What you see is, do you see these little fluctuations here? That's due to the non-zero Coulomb friction, which is also position dependent, because as that screw rotates, the loading on the side loading on the screw changes. So this is clearly, well, OK, you've got some change of impedance, but not very satisfactory. Now we apply his uh, optimized controller, and that's what you get with the little green line here. And what you're seeing is that we've got a 66 times reduction in, in the effective Coulomb friction and a five times reduction in the effective mass. So you can get somewhere with uh, force feedback. And this is the result up here. This is Steve again. This is with our revised controller. And as you see now, whereas previously interacting with that spring, it was unstable. Now it's not stable. See? Looks great. Unfortunately, it also is quite boring. So Steve came up with this test. This is to demonstrate that it really does get out of the way. That's a, we call this the potato chip, but Steve cheated. That's a sun chip. So they're a little stiffer than a Pringle potato chip. But still. Now it turns out that the problem of contact instability is worst for the stiffer the, the surface with force feedback. That's a block of Delrin. And you see that, okay, it bounces as it should, but it's completely stable. 
So it is possible to get around the problems of passivity. So passivity is a nice idea, but with force feedback it may be conservative and we've looked at ways to modify that. And I think at this point, the, uh, the reason that I think it's worth looking at robot impedance control is that it's actually inspired, it's biologically inspired. I mean, the, my earliest work was on prosthetic devices and I got involved with Emilio Bizzi on working with his studies of our movement. And the main thing that I want you to take away is that what we're doing is we're not controlling force, we're not controlling motion, we're controlling a relation between them, right? The ideal, in my opinion, should be to spe you should specify an impedance. That's an ideal, however. There's two, two dominant implementations. One is to implement the system as an impedance that is a force out for motion in. It's like a frequency-dependent stiffness. Alternatively, you could implement your desired behavior as an admittance that is a motion out for force in. I, controlling impedance is ideal, and that's what we've tended to do in our applications, but usually controlling the robot admittance is easier because robots are more naturally described as admittances. However, the question you also have to ask is what kind of task does it work for? And the answer is a lot by now. It's been used for automotive assembly, food packaging, material handling, automated excavation, and most recently for human-robot cooperation. This is from Toyota Motor Corporation. That thing that you're looking at there is the instrument panel for an automobile. And by the time they get to putting that instrument panel into an automobile, it's what's called a high-value-added component. There's a lot of stuff in there. So you can't afford to break it. Not only that, but the instrument panel connects to the, to the car by means of a series of quick connects that don't come out once you put them in. I don't know if you've ever tried to uh, work on your car, but those little plastic things with the bayonets in them, and they go in, but they don't come out without breaking. So you've got to get this right every time. The robot is essentially not only taking the weight of the object, but it sets up an effective impedance, which essentially makes the assembly happen quickly, happen easily, and the human is deciding when and, and where that should happen. And I think at that point, we should stop. Do we have time? I think we may have time for questions. And Joe and I had plotted. We have a choice of material. As I mentioned, we have far too much stuff to present to you. But we have several options. I think you want us to be done by, let's say, 10 to 6, right? <laughs> so Joe has prepared some material on humans involving in, involved with contact tasks. I have some material that I can show you on same basic approach applied to uh, amputation prosthesis for an upper extremity. Or I have more stuff on physical system theory, which is heavy duty stuff. Audience vote. Joe, all, all in favor, let's see, we should give people, why don't you come up here? <laughs> how, how should we do this? We, we should. Uh... So, so we, so, so we rule out the theory one. Okay, I, I agree with that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So wait a minute. We should, we should do this proper. This is, this is dictatorial uh, <laughs> democracy. You guys are like sheep. You know, you, sh you should be standing up and. <laughs> All right. We're going to do what Joe said. So. This is some work that I've been involved in with a lot of colleagues. Uh, the notion of developing motorized artificial arms for amputees, and our goal is to provide more natural function. And um, most, of, um, most am amputees are unilateral. Uh, the main reason for that is that they've got one unimpaired arm and one, impaired, and, and one that, th that they've, they've lost. Uh, the reason that happens, by the way, is that if you've had an injury big enough to lose both arms, you probably died from it. And that's a crude way to put it, but it's actually an accurate assessment. Now you think about this from an engineering point of view. So you've got an amputee, and let's say he was a right-handed before the amputation, like me. He lost his, his right arm, and then he's got his left arm, and he's got an amputation prosthesis. How, how likely do you think it is that you as an engineer can to design a device that would make him not use his residual non-dominant arm for fine manipulation? Engineers are pretty good, but 
this is a pretty good piece of hardware. It's going to be very difficult to have the prosthetic device be anything other than the sort of the, the left hand, the non-dominant hand. So that means that you're going to perform your fine motor task with the unimpaired hand, and the prosthetic arm is going to be the non-dominant role of supporting objects, steadying them, right? So that says that physical, skillful control of physical contact is going to be an absolute key to arm prosthesis function. And just moving the arm around is not enough. You've got to be able to handle contact. So what we went after was to make a arm prosthesis with controllable mechanical impedance. I think I want my sound back up again. It was not that long ago the prosthesis for amputees were very primitive. Now there are advances being made with robotics, and some of the newest advances are being made right at MIT. And as Eyewitness News reporter Lauren Scott tells us, robotics have improved the use of artificial limbs to function almost as well as a person's arm or leg. Before 25-year-old Brian Mathis lost his arm in an electrical accident, he hadn't planned on a career working with prosthetics. But his experience prompted him to try and help other amputees. Brian has been fitted with a robotic arm that moves on command. Flex my muscle just like I would have um, before, and it makes some little motor in the elbow move. So it moves up and down because of that. It's, it's kind of simple. It's very simple. And it's, it's very spontaneous. I like it. Because of Brian's success with his robotic arm and his interest in prostheses, he is now helping researchers at MIT develop what is promising to be the next generation of robotics. What we do here in terms of research can hopefully apply to people who actually do make the arms, okay? And perhaps in just a little chip, like a computer chip in your calculator, um, plug it in and provide a prosthesis that acts the way the empty would expect it to act and performs what he wants to do. Brian says robotics has enabled him to say he doesn't think of himself as handicapped. I don't feel that way. My lifestyle isn't that way. My friends forget that I have one arm. And that's, that's gotten a few funny situations before, but um, no, I don't feel handicapped. Lauren Scott, TV4, Eyewitness News. So that was the, that's the um, basic TV program version of it. A, a, a thing that I should point out is that when, you, when you're talking about uh, amputation prosthesis, you have all the hard problems. So you don't just have a robot interacting with an object. You've got a, you've got a machine like a robot that has to interact with a human. There's, there's, there's some human left there, and you have to control or manage the interaction between the prosthetic device and the residual limb segments at the same time as managing the interaction between the prosthetic device and objects in the world. So you've got two places you've got to control the interaction. And on top of that, the machine has to be lightweight. I have to be able to carry it around. I've got to, I've got to have, I can't have, I've got to be able to manage the, uh, the power as well. So it's a really, really hard problem. We cheated on that because we said, look, well, let's solve the control problem. Controller B, slow speed, second trial. constrained object. Go as fast as you can. This is as fast as you can. Controller B, high speed. No friction, no weight. This is Brian Mathis, my, uh, our amputee subject. Brian was so fast with this thing that he broke the hardware a couple of times, which is a real pain in the neck. But that's what happens. The key thing is that uh, be, we're asking here to perform a constra constrained motion task, so motion control won't work. Because in order to do this, if this was a motion control prosthesis, he would have to know the exact circular path of the, uh, of the crank. It's not going to happen. If you do it with pure force control, he can't stabilize it. 
He's actually managing the interaction between an, an intact shoulder and the prosthetic elbow. So now, as I mentioned, we sort of cheated on this because this prosthetic device can never leave the lab because it doesn't, it has the control system and the power supply off board. The little cable comes out of the back of it and there's a big box over here that has the power supply, the controller and everything else. But with this, we can simulate any kind of controller we want. And in fact, that's what's here. Basically, we designed a sort of an emulator, kind of like a flight simulator for prosthetic devices. So in this, we can mimic any behavior you want and that allowed us to do precisely controlled st studies. In this case, we used, we looked at transhumeral uh, amputation, motorized elbow cable operated terminal device. The interface from him to the device is through the electrical activity of opposing muscles, which are in the residual part of his, of his limb. That's the, some non-trivial parts too that I won't go into. Our controller essentially mimics natural muscle behavior such that when the two muscles are active simultaneously, we increase the effect of stiffness around the elbow, basically by cranking up a position gain and, and a velocity gain. It's, it's that straightforward. It works quite well. Controller B, trial one. God, you guys can get this. How this both happen? Ready? So one of the things I think is important here is that if you have this natural impedance control, that is you're, you're controlling both where you want the thing to be and you're controlling the impedance around that point, it actually reduces the precision and channel capacity required for control. I don't have to tell the controller the exact circular path of that crank. I just say, well, you know, make the system soft and you know, pull and push. So a strategy of pull towards you and push afterward works fine. Secondly, this scales easily to multiple degrees of freedom. If you look at this as a NASA's uh, Robonaut, which is using impedance control, I showed you Toyota's vehicle assembly. I think we're going to hear about Kuka's uh, lightweight arm, that thing over there. Handling excess degrees of freedom can be done. And I think that a requirement is high, highly backdrivable hardware, but you may hear otherwise later in the week. I think we should stop at this point. Let me stop there and take questions.
Say again, please. So the, the, the question was, what happens if you don't have interactions? Can you make free form move? Yeah. And the answer is that you can handle that. In fact, he did. If you saw in the sock task, he's able to control the position of the, of the, of the prosthetic elbow before and after he makes contact with, with, with the sock, right? So the, the thing is, this is why you need the, the equivalent network. So I've got a, a motion controller, which if there's zero force at the output, well, I get that motion, you know, approximately. But then when I contact, I give up on getting exactly that motion. I have an impedance which tells me how do I generate force as a function of the deviation from the nominal motion. So the virtual trajectory is the motion part. No interaction, I get the virtual trajectory. The impedance says what happens when I don't have, when I, when I don't have free motion. That's correct. Depends on what you want to do. If you take a look at how, how humans move, humans do a pretty good job at, at moving, but they're not very precise. As you saw from Joe's work, that you know humans make more or less straight line trajectories, but a typical human straight line trajectory has a lateral deviation of something on the order of 5% the extent of the movement. For a robot, that would suck, right? If you were going to, you know, a robot in Detroit putting seams, uh, putting a glue down a, down a seam for assembly, that's not acceptable but that's a good application for motion control. So there will be a trade-off. However, if you have variable impedance, so that you could make the impedance get real high as needed, then you get good motion control. So one of the issues is, what is the range of impedance that you can get? And another issue which we haven't got into is, what's the rate of change of impedance? Suppose I wanted to be able to bump into stuff and all of a sudden get real, get, get real compliant? That's a, big, that's a difficult thing to do. Gentlemen in the back, I can't, uh, shout. Louder. So the question was, what, what do we know about the rate at which humans can control impedance? The shorter answer is we don't know a whole lot. The longer answer is it seems to be limited by the rate at which you can change the activation level of a muscle. And as I was showing to somebody else before, muscles, quite aside from the delays due to feedback, due to neural, neural conduction, neurons, neurons conduct at about 100 meters a second. And so you can get a good sense of the, the, the de delay magnitudes from that. But quite aside from the delay due to neural conduction, muscles are slow. So try this ex experiment. You know, move your arm like this, say pick 20 degrees, and go as fast as you can. But don't, but keep the amplitude. And try going as fast as you possibly can. And you young guys can probably do that faster than I can. But if you can get up to five hertz, you're doing really well. So you really can't get high bandwidth behavior out of, out of muscles. That seems to be the limitation on impedance change. It was how rapidly can you take the, the muscles and Wang him, wang him up. But good data on that's not, not well available. Maybe David or Etienne have more to say on that. Question from Madhu. I can't, I can't. I can talk like this. You can use the yeah, microphone over there. You. There's a microphone. So for mapping e EMGs to, uh, I, I guess, the virtual trajectory, was, did any, any old mapping work in the sense, can, is there something special about choice of the mapping that people could learn it better? So what we, what we did, I don't know if everybody heard the questions, what do we use for the mapping from EMG to virtual trajectory? What we did was essentially, uh, like most things, we took the dumbest, simplest approach that we thought would work. So we assumed that we could m m describe the, the variable impedance behavior of each muscle by a bilinear relation between muscle force, muscle length, and activation level. And I can show you separately that that is the simplest linear, bilinearized approximation of a very, uh, variable impedance muscle. Took that for each muscle, then you take that and the uh, difference of activities, the difference in levels of activity determines an equilibrium position and the sum of the activities determines the effect of impedance. And that was what we did, and it's by no means the best thing to do, but it worked. 
Now, processing the EMG signal to get a clean control signal, that's not trivial. And there's more to that story, but that's independent of the mapping. The thing is, that these people need to hear, not, yeah. not just me. Right. So, um, impedance always adds. In, yeah, so, if you have a single pulley and two muscle system, and the muscles have intrinsic impedance, uh, can I actively reduce the joint impedance to be lower than what would be the intrinsic of the muscles? So you can, it is possible to take advantage of the kinematic stiffness. Remember this, this stiffness due to the kinematics, that actually in most cases will tend to uh, cause a negative stiffness, meaning it will reduce the effective impedance as you increase tension. In particular, if you make the proportionality constant between the actuator stiffness and the actuator tension small enough, that is, so you, the stiffness goes up, but, but not a whole lot, then you can bring the stiffness, the, the net stiffness, to zero and even go negative. I see. I mean, think of it. Suppose you have a tension actuator with zero, with, with, with zero output impedance. Right. And it's, then I can always go to negative stiffness. Now I add a little bit of stiffness, but not enough, and I, I, I get a range. And that was unstable in that uh, ten-pole example because del r by del theta terms were always making it negative? Yeah, I mean, think about it this way. I mean, if you, the, the human skeleton looks like a collection of sticks with, with strings on the outside of them, right? And imagine a stack of blocks, a stack of bricks, but I put cables around the outside of the bricks. I tension up the cables, what do I get? So you guys who have had an engineering training, you've heard about Euler buckling? That's exactly what this is. You move it slightly one way, and these cables get to have a smaller moment arm, and these cables get to have a bigger moment arm. That comes out of the fact that muscles are on the outside, not on the inside. So, if you want to make a tension, a, a an endoskeletal device driven by tension actuators, then you have to have impedance going up with uh, tension. And I, I, I maintain that that's actually a fact of evolution, and I'd love to work with an evolutionary biologist to figure out if we could check when that evolutionary uh, change happened. Muscles have that property, which is a fortuitous accident. I, I, I've been, I, I, I was thinking, oh, crabs and lobsters, maybe they don't have that, but they use the same muscle. And apparently the muscle physiology goes v way, way back. It goes back before there were any kind of hard uh, skeleton at all. So, I mean, I'd love to work with an evolutionary biologist to figure that one out, but I don't know how to do it. All right, thank you very much. We have to wrap it up for today. Um, maybe we we'll follow up on your offer if it was one that next year we have just seven days of you and Joe. Um, might be a very nice idea because I think there are enough questions for seven days. Um, Neville will be here until tomorrow, 3 p.m., because then he goes to a different meeting. And I think he will be back on Thursday evening. So, there's still some chance for discussion, and probably tonight uh, during drinks. Um, your slides are online, so if you uh, find the internet fast enough to download them, please do so. Thank you very much.